Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to Microsoft Reactor live stream event. My name is Rashmita and I'm the Bengaluru Reactor event planner. I would now like to welcome Jaya Matthew, our speaker for today's session. Jaya Matthew is a senior data scientist at Microsoft, where she is a part of the Azure Global Industry Artificial Intelligence team. Her work focuses on the deployment of AI and ML solution to solve real business problem for customers in multiple domains. Prior to joining Microsoft, she has worked with Nokia and HP on various analytics and machine learning use cases. She holds an undergraduate as well as a graduate degree from the University of Texas at Austin in mathematics and statistics. Today, Jaya will cover natural language processing, transfer learning and BERT models. The session will run for approximately 50 minutes and 10 minutes of Q&A session. Jaya will try to answer all your questions at the end of the session. Next slide, slide please. Before we get into the session, a quick word on a code of conduct. The key thing to take out here is to be respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences, and kind and considerate in the way you engage. The chat will be open throughout, and we do encourage you all to participate. If this is your first time joining us, please note that our Teams live session, there is a 30 seconds delay from speaker to audience. So please feel free to post questions in the chat, but be aware that you may not receive a response straight away because of this lag. But for now, I will hand over to Jaya to begin the session. Over to you, Jaya. Thank you, Rashmita, for the introduction and welcome to the talk. I do realize it's a little late in the evening, but thank you for having dialed in. So the agenda for the talk today is, um, so obviously we're trying to understand what this BUZZ acronym NLP is. And before we get started with what is natural language processing, I kind of thought it's interesting to just think of what is language in general. And once we define what is language and the nuances of all the different languages that we have in the world, then we get into the second bullet item, which is what is natural language processing. So that's what you guys have come in here for the talk. Then to kind of motivate the topic in general, I will introduce you to some of the common applications of natural language processing that we see in our day to day lives. Many a times we do not even realize that under the hood, some of these applications use NLP. Then we get into the next two sections, which ends up being a little more technical, but it's useful for you to understand um, what are the challenges, some of the standard tasks, then a little bit of evolution in terms of NLP, uh, what is a language model, then and also try and understand how transfer learning kind of help NLP to a great extent. Then in terms of getting started with pre-trained models, obviously there are a bunch of pre-trained models. If you look at the glue and the super glue benchmarks, there are new models coming every other month. So, I mean, to get started, I have specifically picked the BERT model and some of the variants. So once you kind of learn uh, one model, it's easy for you to go and explore other models. Then we get into the more applications, customizations, etc. So there are a bunch of out-of-the-box out of APIs available, which might help you in your NLP use cases. So I would be focusing on some Microsoft APIs that I have used extensively. There are obviously APIs from a bunch of other vendors, Google, Amazon, all the major cloud providers have APIs that gives you out-of-the-box solutions. So you don't have to do the heavy lifting of actually customizing any model and building it from scratch. Then in the event these out-of-the-box APIs don't work in your specific use case, you might want to consider how to customize some of these pre-trained models. So in terms of customization, you first need to annotate your data. So for annotation, there are a bunch of open source tools. I would introduce you in a slide to something called Docano, which is an open source that you can kind of deploy onto any major cloud provider. Then once you annotate your data, then you're ready to kind of use some of these pre-trained models. So our team has built an NLP open source repository that I'd give you the links to. It has a 
bunch of Jupyter notebooks, which would help you get started in your journey of learning and demystifying NLP. Towards the end, I would wrap up with some useful links in the event that you're actually interested in exploring the topic further. And uh, like Rashmita said, we should have about five to 10 minutes at the end to address most of your questions. OK, so now let's get started with the fun part. Like, I mean, all of us communicate every day and you know when someone asks you what is language you're like okay i don't really know how to define language so one of the things is all social animals be it bees whales dogs cats all communicate with one another but interestingly only humans have developed a language which is more than just a set of prearranged signals so when and how the special talent of language developed among us human beings is impossible to say. And it's generally assumed that this was a long process of evolution. So if you do want to read more about it, there is a link on the history of language. Now throughout my slide deck, I typically have links. So if you're interested in learning more about the slide, where I got the content and mm, anything you can actually look at the slides. So on the right is this really sweet um, graphic which kind of gives you a list of world language families. So interestingly, there are more than 7000 spoken languages and languages come in families. So you have the Indo-European, the European, the Indic, the Slavic, the Germanic, the Uralic, etc. So it's kind of interesting to see how many languages we have and how it evolved into different groups of languages. OK, now I came across this really sweet uh, graphic on what is language and why is it really important? So language is some sort of um, it enables us to communicate in a very meaningful manner. So there is obviously communication, which is a one way communication where I can tell you something or you can tell me something. Then there's obviously the two way conversation where, you know, Two people interact, multiple people interact, and both sides feel understood. Then once we understand and we communicate with one another, this leads to collaboration. So we uh, we can think, plan and make decisions together. And then because of all that, you know, you can, I mean, engineers make bridges, scientists do research together, etc. This leads to co-creation as well as joint activity of making and doing things. So language in general is not a very simple topic. So uh, this is just a couple of slides introduction of what is language. Now let's get into the buzz acronym NLP and demystify that a little bit. So what is this NLP? So NLP stands for Natural Language Processing, which is a branch of artificial intelligence that deals with the interaction between computers and humans using natural language. So if you kind of think of it, the two domains that overlaps in this, it's linguistics, like everything to do with language and grammar and stuff like that, and artificial intelligence, which is more like all the machine learning AI. Now, what is the goal of NLP? The ultimate goal of NLP is to read, decipher, understand, and make sense of human languages in a manner that's valuable to us. So most NLP techniques rely on machine learning to derive meaning from human language. So in one slide, it is like when computers can speak human, every human can speak with computers. So I mean, typically when you think of computers, it's one of these things where you have to code and program. But now if a computer can understand what we speak to it or which is more natural for us human, it just makes it accessible to everybody. OK, so now let's get into what are some of the common NLP applications. So most of us have seen this. Sometimes it's annoying when this predictive text comes. So in all our mobile devices, when we type an email or a chat or a WhatsApp, there's always predictive text that comes in the little, you know, little bar about your keypad. So essentially, you know, I'm typing something and the moment I start typing Y-O-U, it immediately prompts, are you trying to type your, yours, etc. So this predictive text, how does this come in here? So this is NLP under the hood. Well, I do agree sometimes a predictive text is annoying because it autocorrects and it's not what I really want, but it's learning under the hood. Then 
all of us use uh, some sort of Zoom calls, Teams for pretty much most of the activities that we've done for the last one year while working remote, connecting with our families, etc. In these apps, we have the option for live captions where, you know, people who have issues with listening, disability or just need to see the captions or subtitles, then that is there. So that is pretty much another NLP application under the hood. Then we all use search engines, especially Google, Bing search, where in the search bar, we kind of uh, type out a bunch of words. So this was, this is a screenshot where I pretty much have started typing what is deep and the moment I type in the first two alphabets L E it immediately prompts. Are you trying to say learning is learning the word you're looking for? So essentially it also gives you other suggestions. Well, are you looking for deep learning software, deep learning AI, deep learning in education? So what is it that you're looking for? So essentially it's enabling enabling me to be more productive in my search. It's helping me discover different areas of deep learning if I'm totally new to the topic. Another service that uses NLP is the translator service. So if I go into Bing Translate or Google Translate and I kind of want to know how do I say hello in Hindi? So I mean, it immediately gives me the Devangari script, but if you're completely new to the language, you're not going to know how to read the script. So it also has a transliterated option, which is more like the script I know how to read, so I know it's Namaskar. That's how you say hello. Now, if you do not know how to say it in the native accent, there's also an audio option as well as it gives you suggestions on how to use it in a sentence, etc. So that's also NLP. Then we all use social media these days. So if you look at Twitter, LinkedIn, so I mean, if you're if you have actually listened to a song stuck in your head and you want to try and find out the artist or the title of the song you you know the google app actually lets you hum the tune and kind of help you figure out you know who is the singer who is the artist the title etc and then i can actually find the song that i heard in the radio channel or fm or whatever then the next one is a screenshot from my LinkedIn newsfeed where I actually follow the company Nestle and they had um, something written in a language that I do not understand. So then it had that little option in there which says, um, would you like to translate? And then can you rate the translation? Rate the translation is, uh, so first thing is translate. So then it enables me to understand what the post from Nestle is all about. And then in the event I actually know the two languages, I can rate the translation. This ends up being more like additional data points for LinkedIn or any of those NLP models to be retrained. So those are all uh, NLP use cases. So then some of us, um, especially people who have dyslexia, it is useful to have speech readers. So many a times, you know, reading the document as is, is, is difficult for some people. Um, so then you have the audio button which would read the email out to you loudly and then I mean, not only people with dyslexia, so maybe you, you enjoy uh, audiobooks and audiobooks right now, you do have a person read it out to you, but maybe in the future you could just have NLP have it spoken to you. Okay, so in summary, so now we've looked at a whole bunch of NLP use cases and I'm pretty sure most of you have used one or two of these applications somewhere. So NLP is the driving force behind all these applications. In summary, so word processors such as Microsoft Word employ NLP to check grammatical accuracy of text, SMSs, etc. Language translation apps like Google, Bing Translate. Some of us do use personal assistants like Siri on our phone, Cortana, Alexa. They all use um, NLP to some extent. Now the challenges. So now we do know there are over 7000 languages. We know the different applications. Obviously, NLP is not an easy topic. So languages are ambiguous. So now let's look at a few sentences. So this is a sentence which we might uh, hear in our news channel, which is Iraqi head seeks arms. 
Now, if you look at the two words head and arms, now it had the meaning could be ambiguous if you just take the word as is. So Iraqi head, is it literally the head of somebody or is it the head of an organization? So that is a little ambiguous. Now seats arms. Now arms, is it the arm of a person or is it arms and ammunition? So you know if you look at words and sentences taken out of context, it means different things. Then think of another example, which is lost money found by well. Now, is well literally a well that's you know in the ground, or is it like in terms of is it a location or is it an agent? Is it the name of a person? So this is what makes NLP so difficult. Then obviously language evolves. So with all the social media and tweets and everything, you end up uh, getting new words, new meanings. Even the Oxford Dictionary kind of adds in new words on a periodic basis. Then different meanings in different contexts, like we looked at the two sentences above. Then there's obviously um, data is sparse, and especially if you're thinking of translation from one language to another, getting parallel corpus of data is not that easy when you actually try and build models. So this is some of the challenges that we face when we try and build NLP models. OK, so now let's kind of think of the standard tasks in NLP. So NLP tasks can be grouped into two groups. One is a natural language understanding tasks, and the other one is a natural language generation. So let's first look at natural language generation. So that is essentially language translation, text summarization. So essentially it's trying to generate language uh, text in a different language. Hence it's called natural language generation. So natural language understanding on the other hand is text classification, sentiment classification, named entity recognition, question answering, entailment, sentence similarity. So those are the bunch of tasks that fall into natural language understanding. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about name entity recognition or text classification, I have previously done talks on those, so that is available in the Reactor YouTube channel. OK, so now that we know a little bit about the history of language, what is NLP, some of the applications, as well as some of the difficulty in doing it, so let's actually get into the core content of this talk. So essentially, if you think of natural language processing and the evolution, it's been evolving from neural language models to neural nets to sequence to sequence learning to attention. And now the big thing is pre-trained models. So we would be focusing on pre-trained models in specific BERT as an example. So first we need to define what is a language model. So the goal of any language model is to compute the joint probability of a sequence of words. So when we type in the search bar in Google or Bing, it's a sequence of words. So essentially we're trying to find the probability of word one, word two, word three all occurring together or the or compute the conditional probability of a certain word, word four, occurring given that the previous three words, word one, word two, and word three have already occurred. So the model is built to compute such probability of a sequence of words of condition probability. Now, we are, we've looked at some of the applications in uh, the previous section. One was machine translation, speech recognition, spelling correction. So let's think about machine translation. So maybe in a certain language, the two words big and high roughly mean the same thing. However, in English, the two uh, words, the bigram, big mouth occurring is much higher than high mouth. You don't hear people say high mouth. You say a person is a big mouth. Then in terms of speech recognition, when we talk to devices like uh, Siri, Alexa, Cortana, etc., now I might be saying that, well, you know, Siri, I love reading. And then um, sometimes when I say, there might be odd gaps and I might say I love read in. So I mean, and it's also the way I say it. Maybe you know it splits the words into read and in as opposed to having it as just one word, which is reading. So then uh, what is that 
NLP would say, well, the occurrence of the word I love reading, reading as one word as opposed to two is higher than the probability of it being two separate words, read and in. Then many a times when I type um, messages, I might mistype. So instead of saying types, I might just say T-Y-E-S-P and then it helps autocorrect. It says the occurrence of the word T-Y-P-E-S um, is higher than T-Y-E-S-P. So the general approach is to use something called chain rule, where the probability in this case it's an example of just a four word sentence. It could be much longer, 30 words in the sentence, etc. So the probability of this four word sentence is probability of per word one multiplied by probability of word two occurring given word one times probability of word three uh, occurring given word one and word two have already happened times probability of word four given word one, word two, and word three has occurred. Okay, so then is the next big area is transfer learning. So now that you know what language modeling is, so the objective in transfer learning is, so let's focus on the left side, which is the semi-supervised. So you are essentially, you're trying to build a language model using a huge corpus of data. So the data that was used when tra training BERT was, um, Wikipedia, which is the encyclopedia that we all go and look and refer in between, as well as something called Book Corpus. So essentially, uh, a language model was built, and that is the pre-trained language model using this open source data like Wikipedia and Book Corpus. So now if I have, so now think of the right side section in the slide where I have a data set, which is pretty much trying to determine the sentiment of the sentence. So, oh, you're trying to find the sentiment of a tweet. And maybe I went and saw a movie and I say, well, the movie was good. So the class is one. I'm happy. It's positive. Or the movie was horrible. So then I kind of rate it as being zero. Not good. So essentially, I have this label data set. I could use this pre-trained language model from BERT and then build overlaid with a classifier to kind of build a sentiment classifier, good, bad. So we'll get into how this gets used in the next couple of slides. So some of the things you want to consider is, so what I did in the right side of the previous slide here was essentially fine tuning phase. So you, you essentially, you need to do a few things, which is choose a model, so when you choose a model, like if I'm choosing BERT, I want to look at what languages does it support, what pre-training tasks and data, what pre-training data was used. Well, in this case, it was Wikipedia and Book Corpus, what pre-training tasks was used. So these are tasks like mass, language, uh, mass word, et cetera. We'll get into that in the next uh, couple of slides. Then you want to look at model size versus quality. So there is this false notion that bigger the model, better the better the quality but many a times you know even if the model is not the biggest it i mean you still are able to get quite good quality so i mean now there's a huge um focus on not necessarily using the biggest possible model because you're thinking of carbon footprint greenhouse emissions etc and you don't want these models running forever and you know you uh, generating a whole lot of carbon in some data center then you also have to have the fine tuning data, which is my data, which is label, the domain adaptation. So in terms of sentiment, maybe this open uh, data set like book corpus, Wikipedia is good. But if you're thinking of very specific domains like healthcare, law, tech, there are certain words that get used, which is not used in our general um, corpus of data. So you might have to do some domain adaptation. Then there's obviously budget. You don't uh, want this endlessly running model for a couple of months. You have some hardware uh, and budget constraints. In terms of inference, once we build the model, one of the things that we want to look at is um, latency and throughput. So just think of it as um, if you have this predictive text in your mobile device, you can't have a user endlessly wait for the predictive test. So latency and throughput is kind of something you need to think about. Then also hardware. I mean, these mobile devices have much smaller, you know, memories and you can't load these huge models in there. So you have to think of all this when you actually build your model and deploy it. 
Then like I alluded to earlier, when you think of uh, choosing your model, you want to look at natural language support. There are more than 7000 languages. So now there are obviously high resource languages, low resource languages. So in terms of high resource languages, you might be able to get specific um, English to French models and French to English, but maybe some certain languages which are rarely spoken used. Those are called low resource languages and you may not actually find this um, model specific, you might have to fall back on a pre-trained model, which just generally supports the top 100 languages, etc. So in the event there is no pre-trained model, you want to use the multilingual option. Then is, like I said, choose the model size. So this is um, a slide which doesn't necessarily have all the latest models in the glue or super glue benchmark, but I think this is good for starters. So if you think of OpenAI, they've come up with the GPT-1, 2, 3 models. So if you look at the number of parameters, GPT-1 had 110 million, GPT-2 has 105 billion, and GPT-3 has 175 billion. So most of these models are really growing in terms of number of parameters. Then if you look at Google, they uh, release their BERT model. That's what we'll focus on, which has 340 million parameters. And then T5, if you look at it, has 11 billion. Microsoft has this Turing NLG. It has also come up with some BERT variants. Then NVIDIA has Megatron, etc. So now in terms of models, um, I would give you an introduction on BERT, but once you learn one kind of pre-trained model, the rest are very, very similar. So what does BERT actually stand for? BERT stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representation from Transformers. So we will be focusing on the BERT model from Google, which essentially has 340 million parameters. If you want to read a little bit more about BERT, there is the link to the Google AI blog. You can read it straight from Google and read the paper. So essentially it has the two steps, which is the semi-supervised learning step where you're trying to build a language model from data, which is book corpus Wikipedia, and you build this BERT model. Then in the supervised step, I have my data set. In this case, I'm trying to classify emails as spam, not spam. And then I use the pre-trained model from step one, and then I build a classifier to determine if it's spam or not spam. Now, Google has claimed that um, once they deployed BERT into their search engines, the search is more relevant. So let's take a look at one of the examples in here. So here they show a before and after scenario. So in the search box, the users actually typed out 2019 Brazil traveler to USA need a visa. So many a times, even when I type out search words, I do not actually make it grammatically correct. It's just like a bag of words sitting in there. So then um, if you look at before BERT was actually used, um, what Google shows as the top result is a Washington Post article, which kind of says that US citizens can travel to Brazil without the red tape of a visa. Now, that's not necessarily, if you look at the context of the search that I did, it's pretty much like, I'm a Brazilian traveler in the year, year 2019. Do I need a visa? Or is is it like a is there like a visa waiver program and I can travel? So if you see after BERT was deployed, they say that they're very accurately able to give the top result as the US Embassy Gov website in Brazil, BR, and the visa section, and it'll tell you about tourism and tourist visa and if you need to apply. So if you see the search result is more relevant. Another example is if I'm searching for math practice books for adults on the right side. So before, essentially it just gives you an Amazon link to math practice for grade six to eight. Now six to eight is not necessarily an adult. However, after BERT was deployed, it kind of says that, so these are screenshots from Google's blog where they've said that their searches is improved. And now after uh, BERT was deployed, it takes you to the Amazon a website for math for grown-ups. So I'm an adult, I want to revise a little bit of math, then it gives me suggestions for books that I could consider. So now BERT actually heralded this NLP's image debt movement. So if you want to uh, read about uh, BERT, you want to actually refer to the paper by 
Devlin et al. from Google AI language, and you find it on archive actually. So then uh, some of these illustrations are from a blog by Jay Alamar. I've given the link to it. He has a YouTube channel as well as a bunch of blogs that simplify some of these very hard concepts very well. So most of these models are pre-trained on massive amounts of data and fine tuned on specific tasks. So we'll get into what these models actually entail. So BERT uses something called a transformer architecture. So now if you don't know what a transformer is, you want to go back uh, and listen to what is encoder, decoder first, and then having an attention layer and then come into transformer. So if you're new, you want to go back and read that because this slide may not be uh, very easy to grasp. So essentially transformers have something called six layers, so BERT base and BERT large have much more layers. If you look at it as 12 and 24, then feed forward network size for transformer was 512, but BERT base and BERT large, it kind of uh, in BERT large, it doubled to 1024. Then they have something called attention heads. And if you read the paper from Google, the pre-training of deep bi-directional transformers, it kind of to, uh, gives you a little more explanation about attention heads and etc. Now, what was the change that they did? So they obviously, if you can see uh, in the table, they have more parameters, they have segment embedding, and they have something called the CLS token. So they obviously have a semi-supervised learning, and then the task used to train the model was a masked word prediction and the sentence following task. So essentially, if you look at the uh, image which says um, the input that I type. So it's always uh, preceded by a CLS token. And then this is two sentences where I say that my dog is cute. That's one sentence. It separates, it separated. Uh, and then the next sentence is he likes playing. So if you look at the word playing, it kind of gets split into play and ing, and then it ends, separator. So the token embedding for each one of the tokens, the input, it has uh, an embedding like CLS, my dog, is cure, separator, etc. Then the segment embedding is the two separate sentences. So you see the first one starts with CLS token, my dog is cute. Then there's a separator, so that is segment A. And then you have he likes playing in the end, that's segment B. And then you have the position embedding, which determines the position. So my is at position one, etc. So the length of this is 10. OK, so now in terms of pre-training, the previous approaches, so they have a bunch of models, Elmo, GPT, uh, all those other models use language modeling tasks, which is to predict the next word to pre-train the model. However, BERT, like I said, uses mask language model and sentence following task. So now let's actually try and understand what this mask language model means. So essentially, if you look at the image on the right, so if the input is you have the CLS token and let's stick to improvisation in this skit. So now you mask this word, which is improvisation. You send it to the BERT model. You have the feed forward network in a softmax and it's trying to predict this mask word, which is it says that with 10% uh, probability, I kind of think that this mask word is improvisation. So that's how it trains the model. So what BERT does is it replaces 15% of the tokens with a mask. And then some tokens also randomly replace and the pre-training task is to predict the missing replace tokens. OK, then is the sentence following task. So what is the sentence following task? So if you look at the image in here, so you have two sentences, which is, uh, which is um, the man mass to the store as one sentence, sentence A, and the sentence B is Penguin, mass of flightless birds. So does it logically make sense that this sentence follows the first sentence? Sentence B follows sentence A, logically. So then essentially you have the mast as well as it's trying to predict if sentence A follows, uh, sentence B follows sentence A. So then if you look at the classifier in here, it says that now 99% probability, no, the sentence B does not logically follow sentence A. So this is how the pre-training was done. Then in terms of classification, the CLS token that we actually add to the beginning of our sentence can be used as a classifier. 
So BERT network is used for feature representation of the whole sentence and the CLS is used for classifier and this is similar to the uh, convoluted neural network architectures where there's a backbone network and feature representation. So now BERT can be adapted to do different tasks. So the CLS token can be used for different things. So if you look at some of this, so there's sentence pair classification, so it can see if you know the sentence pair classification task can be done single sentence classification can be done question answering tasks can be done then single sentence tagging which is that ner can be done so bert achieves state of the art performance on a bunch of these uh, benchmarks which is if you want to look at the glue and the super glue which is the general language understanding evaluation so these are the benchmarks where most models try and do a bunch of tasks and try and come to the leaderboard in here. OK, so this is how uh, the state of the art is. So you have a bunch of metrics and you can see that uh, Bert Large does much better than most of the other models. So this is more technical. If you read the paper, you'll be able to understand that. Now, Bert, in general, uh, as a language model, triggered the development of a whole bunch of other transform architecture models. So the variance essentially included changes in pre-training tasks, objective function, masking, the amount of data used, the type of data used, etc. So if you look at BERT, um, you know, there's ELMO, ULM FIT, then the transformer, then the BERT, and there's the GPTs, then there's Ernie, Qbert, Isselbert, Albert, Roberta, and a bunch of different things. So each one just slightly different things and if you're interested you can kind of go and read up about these different models and see which one works for you okay so now that we've done uh, with the technical section let's actually look at how do i use it so maybe you're a person who doesn't want to know too much about the theoretical aspect of the bird model and language model but you just want to use it in your use case so I would take you through some of the APIs that are available from Microsoft. This out of the box, like I said. So you have something called the cognitive services. If you go into the language section, so essentially you're trying to extract meaning from unstructured text. You have the immersive reader, language understanding, Q&A maker, text analytics translator. So each one is for a different use case. And if you look at the translator, for example, so you have the app where the out of the box API has broad language covering. I mean, at the time I took the screenshot for 70 languages, maybe there are more languages now. Then it's customizable, so you can kind of uh, upload some of your corpus of data and kind of train it for your domain as production ready, it's scalable, there's inbuilt security. So this is an API you could consider using if it works in your scenario. Then there's text analytics API from Microsoft where you can. Um, so this is a screenshot right from their website where you can kind of um, put the text in the box in, on the website and then it analyzes the text and gives you the JSON output So it out of the box detects that the language in the corpus that you sent was English with 100% confidence. It helps you find the key phrases sentiment. Is it positive? Is it negative? So there's in terms of out of the box, it provides broad entity extraction, powerful sentiment analysis, robust language detection and flexible deployment. Very easy to use. Now, what if these out of the box APIs don't work? That's when you want to get into customization, which is a little bit more work. So you have your raw data. You want to first label it and then build your custom models. So there are a whole bunch of open source text annotation tools. I am just um, giving you a brief introduction of one of them, which is called Docano. It provides annotation features for text classification, sequence labeling, sequence to sequence tasks. So you can create label data for all your, some of your NLP tasks, like sentiment analysis, named entity recognition, etc. So this is an animation from the Docano website. It's open source, so it helps you do uh, for translation, named entity recognition, sentiment, etc. You can label right in the tool. So you upload your data, then you can label. So the good thing about Docano is they do have a one-click deployment option. So if you go onto their website, you have this one-click deployment to most of the major cloud providers. 
AWS, Azure, Google. So I've obviously deployed it onto Azure and it seems flaky sometimes, but it does work and it's very easy to use. If you would like to learn a little bit more on how to annotate data on Decano, there, this is a blog that I'd written a while back. So if this is something that's useful, you could consider Docano as your labeling tool. Then if you kind of feel that uh, you, you have your label data, these out of the box APIs do not work for you, you might want to consider using um, our open source repository where you know we have a bunch of scenarios, a bunch of models, it supports a few languages and it's open source and has a bunch of Jupyter notebooks. So the goal of this repository is to provide guidance and a choice of models for common NLP tests that we said, you know, the natural language understanding, natural language generation. So primarily we focus on natural language understanding. It reduces time from business problem to implementation. So many a times you don't know where to start. Here are some sample Jupyter notebooks. You could run it just out of the box and then kind of change the input to source your data. Then um, it, it just makes state of the art models accessible to all. This is built over Hugging Faces models. Then there's some multi language support for some of the use cases, then easy to follow examples that can be used as templates. So these are some of the scenarios that we have covered. So if you look at it, we have text classification. So some of the models that we've used is BERT, ExcelNet. Roberta, etc., and it supports three languages English, Hindi, and Arabic. Then you have named entity recognition, which is BERT, and then it's only English. Most of the other ones are just for English. Then we have some sample notebooks for text summarization, entailment, question answering, sentence similarity, embedding, and sentiment analysis. So this is a very good place for you to kind of go and look at some sample Jupyter notebooks. And even for me, it really helps getting started with these Jupyter notebooks on some virtual machine and see if it suits my needs and then tweak the different parameters and the input data and customize it for my use case. OK, so I think uh, some people had asked me previously as to uh, where, you know, how, how do you get these bird models? So pretty much we get it from Hugging Face, which has the bird based case, uncase. So if you don't want to use this repository, you could directly go to Hugging Face and they have a bunch of models and you can use it from there. OK, so now um, so this is a quick overview of NLP from you know the basics to now. I would like to leave you with uh, some useful links if you're interested in learning more about it. So there are some online learning options uh, from Microsoft. So there's a bunch of Microsoft um, documents uh, where you can explore natural language processing, and that's like a learning path with four modules, which takes roughly around two hours. Then if you're interested in using something called cognitive language services, that's about three modules should take you about two hours. So some of these are just one to two hours. Uh, what's that modules that you can learn on the website when you have some time and then you can also process and translate uh, speech with Azure. So these are some of them. If you go to uh, the docs and the learning section, you can find a bunch of other options as well. Then these are some of the uh, further reading links. So you have um, some of these are the repository that I told you about, the Docano tool. Then these are some blogs from our team. Then Google AI blogs because we focused on BERT. Then this is the paper, the BERT paper on archive. Then these are some of uh, the other uh, websites that I took screenshots on the number of languages in the world, as well as I told you that Jay Alamar has a bunch of very nice illustrations. He makes the topic so much easier for all of us. So then uh, this is the glue benchmark. Like I said, most of these pre-trained models are trying to beat one another in terms of performance. So they have something called a glue and a super glue benchmark. So it's a bunch of tasks and each of these models are trying to outperform the other. So then Microsoft Research has their Turing models. Then this is hugging face in case you want to know 
a little bit more about the models they have. They have so many more models from Microsoft, Facebook, everyone. So these are some of the other previous reactor talks I've done where if you're interested in um, using NLP for named entity recognition, this might be the talk you want to listen to. Then if you're interested in text classification or if you're interested in machine translation. Then is, yeah, so that is the end of my contents and I'll hand it over back to Rashmita to wrap up the talk. Thank you, Jaya, for the session and thank you all for joining us today. I have shared the link to our feedback survey in the chat. Do send your feedback. It will help us to curate topics that better suit our audiences. Also, if you would like to watch this session, a recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in the coming days. For more session, please visit to our Reactor Bengaluru website link. Uh, we have uh, time, so if you have any questions, uh, you can please uh, feel free to drop your questions in the chat box and uh, we can, Jaya can take it. I think we are not getting any more questions, Jaya. So thank you once again. Thank you everyone and have a great evening. Thank you.